I'd like to be in the business of helping other people make things. I haven't found the right place to do that outside of my garage. <laughs> it feels like uh, in my professional career, I'm kind of, uh, there's a lot of stifled creativity or bureaucratic process that prevents that from happening. You know, it's less rewarding. Through college, through high school, I was sort of interested in technology and I did a I was doing graphic design, but I had, you know, one foot in technology. I'm using the photo reference and I'm going by how the object should look. There's lots of different ways I could have done this. I could have done the background first and then worked my way forward. And I ended up changing my career and going full on into technology because I felt, you know, that would be more rewarding and allow me to leverage a lot more of my, uh, my skill sets. And so I went and got lots of Microsoft certifications, learned about the technologies, became relevant in the space, and landed a few jobs in telecom. And realized that you know, you see people at the trade shows that make you know work for maybe a door manufacturer or something or a concrete manufacturer. You know, it's like so boring. You're going to live your whole career <laughs> saying I'm the best door maker, you know, in North Dakota or whatever. You know, for me it was it was more about you know what are the things that I'm passionate about, what are the things that make me happy. And so that's what I've kind of invested in in my personal life is to build out the space to really leverage tools that are emerging in microfabrication and tools that empower us to create and build without all of that bureaucracy, right? You know, at the end of the day, the stuff that's available for the average maker is just amazing. Tools are an extension of my person. You know, I think the way I think about it is, you know, two decades ago before you had uh, commonplace CNCs and 3D printers and you know lots of the um, you know nomads and things like that that allow you to do all these crazy things. You you would work with jigs, right? You may have a saw and a bandsaw and a sander, and you'd create jigs, and those jigs were the the enhancements to your machines that allowed you to do and re repeat activities in your shop. So for me, you know, I work less with jigs and more with. I guess emerging technology and machinery that's able to do those more complex activities and, and for me those tools represent an extension of my capability. Right? And so for me it's a matter of leveraging these high-end tools that have very specialized capabilities to create complex projects that don't look like they're handmade. <laughs> At the end of the day the thing I hate most about um, the products that I make is when they reveal that they're, they've been handmade. And so I try, you know, in all of the work that I do in the shop is to create a, a product that has a nice finish, has a nice feel, and doesn't look like it's been made by hand. I don't want it to look like it's handmade. I basically want to have tighter tolerances that when the casual observer looks at it, it's difficult to comprehend how it was fabricated, how it was machined, how it was assembled by hand. It takes a lot of forethought, it takes a lot of design, and it takes high precision, accurate tools. I would love for this, you know, one day to be able to sustain itself. Um, for now, it's, uh, you know, it's still in the hobby bucket. It doesn't have a revenue stream. I don't make money off of this stuff. It's strictly for the soul.